Welcome to this webinar today where we are shedding light on biofuels in aviation. We are very pleased about the turnout and for the presenters attending today. A big thank and a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Kaja Grotheim. I'm a counselor for environment at the mission of Norway to the EU. And I will try to guide you through this webinar today. But before we start, some housekeeping rules. If you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A window. Please also indicate to who in the panel you are directing the question to. We will pile up all the questions and raise them to the different speakers in the Q&A session. Let's start up. I'm very happy to introduce the first speaker, our ambassador to the mission of Norway to the EU, Mr. Rolf Einar Fifa. Please, Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Kaya. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, distinguished participants, including a uh, member of the European Parliament, uh, Ms. Elsie Katainen, and uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this webinar. And uh, to the speakers, uh, both from uh, the European Union side and uh, from uh, the Norwegian side, uh, I'd like to thank you all and say that we're very grateful for your participation here today. Uh, the uh, topic is aviation, and aviation plays a uh, significant role, a key role, I should say, uh, in Norway's public transport infrastructure. That is due to the size of territory. It's due to uh, long distances, challenging uh, topography with mountains and fjords and islands, and a lack of alternative transport modes, especially for small communities in northern Norway. At the same time, aviation needs to become more sustainable. The Norwegian government has therefore strengthened the climate policy for this sector with a higher CO2 tax, a passenger tax, and a quota obligation for advanced biofuels. To my knowledge, this is the first enforced obligation of its kind for aviation. Moreover, the Norwegian government wishes to facilitate a more rapid development of uh, zero emission aircraft. My experts at the mission, including uh, Kaya Grutjem, who just uh, spoke, have persuaded me, they have convinced me truly, uh, to be as bold uh, as to say that um, if it works in Norway, it may work everywhere. So this, this web webinar will start uh, with the experience with the Norwegian biojet fuel mandate and expand further on our experiences gained so far. From the perspective of the competent ministry in Norway, from the perspective of the airport operator, that is Avinor, and from the perspective of fuel retailer, Airbnb Norway. The second part will focus on the commission's initiative, Refuel EU Aviation. This initiative, which is part of Fit for 55 package, entails a European mandate for sustainable aviation fuels. We do look forward to the presentation from the Commission, a perspective from the European Parliament, and further on the process forward, a seen from the distinguished Slovenian presidency. This webinar, I'm pretty convinced, is going to demonstrate how uh, one European country introduced an obligation to use sustainable aviation fuels. And we do hope that this work will be not only of interest, but of possible relevance for others, including for the upcoming discussions on the refuel aviation proposal. I will uh, hereby conclude I wish you all an extremely successful and productive exchange. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, for your introduction. Then I gi now give the word to the Norwegian Ministry for Climate and Environment, Senior Advisor, Mr. Martin Smedsru Christensen. Hi, thank you, uh, Kaya. Yeah, now, thank you and a uh, very good day to all of you. I'm very grateful to be here today to speak with you about the Norwegian policy for jet biofuels. Uh, I'm working, as Kaya said, in the climate, uh, the Ministry of Climate and Environment in Norway, in the climate department. We are responsible for biofuels and the mandates for road transport and aviation. The Norwegian Ministry of Transport and the Norwegian Environment Agency are also involved in the biofuel policy making from the Norwegian side. I've been challenged to speak about uh, biofuels policy, what does it entail and how it does work. And I will also say some words about how it did materialize and uh, which considerations were made on the way when we introduced the uh, mandate for jet biofuels in Norway. Aviation has a key role in the Norwegian transportation infrastructure, uh, but uh, like all other sectors, emissions must be reduced in the years to come. We have a wide range of measures to reduce emissions from aviation, among them uh, the different part of the uh, ICAO basket of measures. We have uh, taxation, uh, CO2 tax, and uh, we have uh, possibilities for electrification. Uh, but today, uh, this presentation will focus on jet biofuels. Uh, jet biofuels was requested from the parliament in 2016 and followed up in the national transport plan for the period of 2018 to 2029. The government signaled that in the uh, signaled in the national transport plan that it wanted to introduce a blending requirement of one percent uh, sustainable biofuels in aviation from 2019, with a target of 30 percent in 2030. With basis in the national transport plan the Ministry of Climate and Environment issued an assignment to the Norwegian Environment Agency, together with Avinor and the Civil Aviation Authority, to develop an impact assessment. Um, they later um, delivered a report where they uh, analyzed two different models. Uh, the first model was 1% uh, sustainable biofuels with double counting of advanced biofuels. And the second model was 0.5% uh, uh, sustainable advanced biofuels without double counting. Uh, important topics uh, which needed uh, clarification in the assessment uh, report was availability and production of biofuels, uh, different qualities, uh, as well as carbon leakage uh, as a result of price differences between the Norwegian market and other markets. Uh, cost levels and uh, feedstocks uh, were a key uh, thing to, to figure out. And uh, we had at that time in, in 2017 and 2018, we had a tough palm oil debate running in Norway uh, as a result of a uh, fast growing mandate uh, for biofuels in the uh, road uh, sector. And uh, it was really important to ensure sustainability and that we did not get uh, another debate for aviation as well. Um, the report uh, that was developed by the Norwegian Environment Agency uh, was sent on public consultation and we received response from several actors in the industry, NGOs and public institutions. 
the majority was positive to the introduction of a mandate uh, for biofuels. With basis in the report and the consultation, uh, the government decided to uh, uh, go for a, a mandate of 0.5% advanced uh, jet biofuels. Um, the mandate uh, entered into force uh, January 1st, 2020. And uh, its advanced biofuels uh, is defined according to both the A and B feedstocks of the Annex 9 of the uh, Revised Renewable Energy Directive. The uh, mandate or quota obligation uh, is uh, imposed on the uh, fuel supplier and uh, to create uh, flexibility uh, among the uh, fuel suppliers, uh, it's based on the mass balance principle. Um, military flights are exempted from the quota obligation. Um, the, it was estimated that the volumes uh, needed of uh, jet biofuels to fulfill the obligation was around 6 million liters. But um, since then, we have had uh, the COVID situation. And uh, when we look at the numbers now, uh, the biofuel consumption uh, for aviation ended up around 2.5 million liters, equal to 0. 5% uh, biofuels. Uh, lessons learned from the uh, from the quota obligation is that it's important with a solid uh, impact assessment uh, report. Uh, we had a broad consultation and we read the replies carefully. Uh, it took some time, but uh, it it really uh, it was important to include all relevant authorities and, and actors out there uh, and also keep in mind the broader uh, transport perspective aviation is one part of the transport sector but uh, in norway we also had biofuels for road transport we used the experience and knowledge from the uh, quote obligation for road transport to develop the the quote obligation for aviation. And we are now uses, using this knowledge again to develop mandates uh, for shipping and construction. Um, the uh, Norwegian Environment Agency are now working on a report to evaluate the mandate uh, this fall. And after that, the ministry will consider adjustments of the quota obligation and a potential increase. Uh, we see that uh, the Fit for 55 package and the uh, refuel EU aviation is uh, really important and a process we need to follow closely in the time to come. We see also see uh, national and regional initiatives around the world and we hope that the yeah, Norwegian uh, quota obligation can contribute to uh, uh, be inspiring and contribute to reduce emissions and create a market for sustainable aviation fuels and also the predictability needed to increase production of sustainable fuels. Um, that was it and I think uh, yeah feel free to ask questions in the Q&A session. Thank you very much and thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Martin Smetsru, for your contribution and your reflection about the experiences with the Norwegian blending mandate. Now uh, we move on, uh, and I give the word to Mr. Olav Mosvold, manager for Avinor Car Carbon Reduction Program. Go on, Olav. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen here. So again, thank you so much for uh, having me and for the kind uh, introduction uh, by the ambassador. 
Uh, my name is Olaf Larsen. I work with uh, Avinor, the Norwegian airport operator and ANSP. Uh, we operate the 43 state-owned airports. And as the ambassador said, uh, uh, Norway is totally dependent on, uh, on aviation. And it's uh, our, man our mandate uh, to, uh, to operate the, the infrastructure for aviation in Norway. At the same time, uh, we all know that uh, we have to fulfill the Paris goals. Uh, it will be costly, but really, really necessary emission reductions. And we have to bear in mind that the aviation industry is highly competitive between the airlines, between the countries, between the regions. So to ensure a level playing field is, uh, is, uh, is key uh, when addressing uh, the enormous challenges ahead of us. There are technology solutions out there to reduce emissions from, uh, from the industry. The airspace can still be more efficient. The aircraft can be more energy efficient. Sustainable aviation fuels is the topic for, uh, for this uh, webinar. And we are also working on electrified aircraft and we see how hydrogen as an energy carrier is, uh, is coming, coming up as, a, as actually a very interesting and relevant uh, solution. But whoever we talk to, uh, everybody says that to, to, uh, to fulfill the goals, cooperation is key. And that's not only cooperation between the airlines and the airports and within the industry, it's all, it will also be cooperation with uh, the public-private uh, cooperation. So we've been cooperating uh, in, uh, in Norway for, for many years already with the, uh, with the airlines, uh, produced several reports, and we have not only produced reports, we also have carried out uh, quite interesting projects together. Um, and to the right, uh, on my screen at least, you can see our latest publication. Uh, it's coming out very soon in, in, uh, in English. It's a program for increased production and uptake of sustainable aviation fuels carried out uh, together uh, with the uh, Norwegian aviation industry. Our goal is that Norwegian aviation should be fossil free by 2050. And to reach that goal, uh, SAF is key. We have been monitoring the development since 2007 and Scandinavian Airlines, I think they first wrote about sustainable aviation fuels in their annual report of 2001 or something. So they started out really, really early. And we've carried out quite a few projects. I'll mention a few of them now. And I would also like to highlight that uh, Scandinavian Airlines and, and, and Vidra have an option of, of, of voluntary purchase of uh, biofuels when you uh, book flights and check in in their, in their apps and on the website. So that's an, also an interesting approach. So uh, the first flights on biofuel in Norway actually was carried out in 2014 uh, in relation with a big uh, carbon conference uh, in, uh, in, in Oslo, the Zero Conference. Um, and then one and a half year later, was it? Uh, in, in January 2016, uh, we carried out what we think was an extremely interesting uh, project. And the project was, I think it's fair to say that it was initiated by Lufthansa and what later became AirBP, Statoil Aviation in those days. And uh, we came on board really, really early. And uh, it was, again, cooperation between airlines and uh, fuel producers and fuel suppliers, including Sky Energy and Neste. Uh, the fuel was dropped into the main fuel farm for the first time uh, ever and distributed in the hydrogen dispenser system. And we, 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 uh, we split the premium cost between the project partners to, to, uh, to make this project fly. It worked very well. Uh, it was expanded in 2007 also to Bergen. And all in, in 2018, we also had a small volume in, uh, in, in both Oslo and, uh, and, uh, and Bergen. And I think uh, the main outcome of that project or result was that it was absolutely feasible and doable to, uh, to drop in uh, biofuel in the existing infrastructure, and it also reduced costs quite significantly. So the drop-in mandate, as uh, Martin explained, uh, came online uh, in January 2020, and uh, it actually has had no, really no practical implications for us as an airport operator. Uh, it is handled by the fuel supplier, and uh, 
the airlines uh, purchase uh, fuel from their fuel suppliers. And to my knowledge, uh, last year in 2020, uh, some batches of uh, jets or, or SAF was uh, shipped to, uh, to the airport in Oslo and to the airport in, in, uh, in, in Olesund. But uh, the way the, the mandate is, um, is uh, constructed, it doesn't really matter. Uh, well, it doesn't matter at all which airport and at what time of year and what volume you drop in the fuel in Norway. It just has to be dropped dropped in during the year. Uh, from the Norwegian aviation industry, uh, we are extremely concerned about sustainability issues and um, uh, for, 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 for many reasons. Uh, Martin mentioned the big palm oil debate that was uh, quite uh, instrumental, I think, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in many respects. Uh, but we're also, or the airlines are worried about the total costs. The mandate comes in addition to the domestic CO2 tax, the air passenger duty, uh, which are both of them are um, sort of special for Norway, and then obviously the EU ETS and uh, and, and Corsia, which is uh, also applies to to uh, to all airlines. So uh, for the future and for the uh, let's say implementation of different mandates or considerations in that direction, other places. Sustain the sustainability and transparency is key. And I think it's also extremely important to highlight that we need to ensure a level playing field for the airlines. Um, and not least that incentives for increased production must come online. And there are several technology routes and feedstocks required to, uh, to fill, fulfill the quite ambitious goals uh, set by the industry in various countries around the world. So um, thank you, and uh, looking forward to the questions uh, in the Q&A session later on in this uh, seminar. Thank you so much. Thanks to Avinur for shedding light on how the blending mandate has worked on ground. Uh, now I will give the floor to the last Norwegian speaker, Mr. Arne Jungman, finance manager in AirBP Norway and one of the retailers for biojet fuel in Norway. Please, Arne Jungman, go on. Thank you. Uh, I'll make it simple, so no slides uh, today, but uh, so you don't to see me. But um, basically, uh, just want to pick up what we have also said. Uh, I was part of the project in uh, 2016, so I'm also very happy with that. I'll come back to that in a uh, little while. As you said, I was, I'm a finance manager for Nordic countries and also BP's head of country in, in Norway. So in both those roles, I've had the, the yeah, I've been much involved with this mandate introduction. And uh, I'll come a little bit back to that. Before I go, get to that, I would like to say some a few words about uh, the BP strategy. It's a brand new strategy that was uh, launched last year. So we, we have a clear purpose and ambition in BP globally now. So our purpose is to reimagine energy for people and our planet. And our ambition is to be a net zero company by 2050 or sooner and to help the world get to net zero also. So that's very strong ambitions. And of course, we have strategies to, to back it up. And we are now no longer defining ourselves as an oil company. We are defining ourselves as an integrated energy company. Uh, we will tenfold increase our investment in low carbon up to $5 billion per year. And at the same time, reduce our oil and gas production by 40% within the end of this decade. So big changes for a company. And uh, as you can see, um, very clear, clear set out direction. And also within uh, aviation, we have uh, an ambition to achieve 20% global market share of uh, SAF uh, within the biojet of SAF market. So very clear goals and ambitions. And the reason why I mention this is that it's, this new strategy fits very well with the with the proposed um, EU Fit for 55 package. So we are totally supportive of that um, package, the direction of travel. Uh, you know, this company is totally aligned with this. So um, we want ambitious and effective climate politics to help us all get net zero. And uh, we expect these policies to stimulate carbon, uh, low carbon consumer demand, and um, create by that create business opportunities for companies like us, including in the SAP area. So as uh, so we look very much forward to work with the uh, European policymakers and be a part of uh, making this, this happen. 
So, um, so that's a very good alignment. A little bit on background and content. Um, so we have been looking for ways to reduce climate uh, or climate footprint, carbon footprint for several years. Um, we know that, as uh, so I mentioned, electric and hydrogen planes will come and will eventually, hopefully, replace Jet A1. But we also know that that will take a long time. Uh, this is a very conservative industry for, for obvious reasons. They don't want to put passengers in, into a plane, the technology that has not been thoroughly tested. And even the, the blending of SAF with the with Jet A1 has been uh, going on for many years. The testing has been thorough and it was eventually approved for up to 50% blend. And that's significant, 50% SAF into into an aircraft is a significant uh, reduction. So if you uh, imagine 80% um, efficiency, that is a net 40% reduction of, uh, of uh, emission. So, um, so it's really, it's the only way forward as we can see it in the short run. So having biofuels or sub blended into the jet fuel is, uh, it's easy because it's produced the existing infrastructure, you don't need any separate storage or anything. So, um, so it's definitely the, the only and the best way in the, in the short run. Um, yes, and uh, I also like to mention our track record. Um, as when I mentioned the, the project, we were also very proud to be part of that project in 2016. And we, as the first supplier, I also come from Southern Aviation, so I remember it from that time also. So, so yeah, we were um, very proud to be, be in that project together with Avinur and uh, three of our customers, South Lufthansa and Kaila. And so, um, very successful project. And this is obviously something we did because we wanted to, we didn't have to do it. The time that we, we wanted to meet. And we also have uh, back in 2016, we were also the first supplier to become carbon neutral uh, in our operations at the airports uh, worldwide. And uh, we have until today uh, supplied SAP to more than 20 locations across three continents. So it's nothing new for us. We have quite experience in, uh, in SAP already. Uh, and we think yeah, this is a good, good idea. So uh, when we first heard about the mandate initiative in Norway, uh, we were positive to having that mandate, but I was also happy to admit I was a little nervous about the practical consequences. Uh, you never know what, what this could mean. Would it be practical supply and, uh, in, in logistics um, problems for us? Would it uh, require more resources? Would it require us to reprogram all our IT systems? And you never know what, uh, what can happen. But, uh, Seems like uh, Martin and his people did a good impact assessment. So, uh, so not of, nothing of that uh, happened. There were no reasons for concerns. So and I think also the starting point was very well uh, adjusted to the lack of availability of, uh, of SAP. Uh, obviously, SAP is, uh, the production of SAP is very low today. And hence, the prices are also very high. So, uh, so I think starting with 0.5% is the right thing to do with the ambition to increase to 30% by 2030. Um, I think that's the right, the right way to start. We're also um, very happy that um, it was a physical blend requirement, but it was done in a very flexible way. So we can decide when to do it, how to do it, and um, in what location to do it. So that also helped a lot, make it a lot easier to, to handle. And also the reporting system was very simple. Um, so uh, and it was using the same volume metrics as for the exercise duties. So very easy for the auditors also to to uh, verify and vehicle sign the data. Um, so all in all, a very good, uh, good way of doing it. It's also flexibility for suppliers to, um, to cover mandate requirements between suppliers. That's also a good thing. So the only, the only one issue that I can think of is uh, we had some problems in uh, uh, regarding, I won't go into details, but it's regarding civilian traffic at military airports. There was something that no one had thought about in that space that made competitors having to disclose some competition data that they would like not to disclose. But I'm sure that will be fixed by the next reporting. That's a minor thing. Uh, overall, I think we are very, very happy with uh, the way this was uh, introduced. So, um, so to sum it up, um, I think two messages from us. We are very, we are fully supportive of the Fit for 55 package in general and the introduction of SAF mandates in the aviation industry. We support that. And the second message is that we are impressed with the way Norway introduced the, the mandate and we fully support that model going forward. So that's going to be copied all the places. That's perfectly fine with us. Thank you.
Thank you so much uh, to BP in Norway for, for giving us information about the practical and commercial aspects of the blending mandate. Now we will move from, from Norway to the European sphere. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Grégoire Lecomte, policy officer from DG MOVE in the European Commission. And he will present the proposal, Refuel EU Aviation, which is part of the Fit for 55 package presented in July. Please, Mr. Grégoire Lecomte, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to everybody. And first off, I'd like to really thank Mr. Ambassador and also the mission of Norway to the EU for the invitation um, and opportunity today to uh, present um, our latest initiative on sustainable aviation fuels here. Um, so thank you for putting up the slides. Um, I'll try to be um, uh, concise, as concise as possible. Um, and first off, on the first slide, um, give you a bit of um, a general background, uh, a bit of context uh, in which this um, policy initiative is taking place. So um, you're probably well familiar with it now. Um, middle of July uh, of this year, the European Commission adopted a package, um, legislative proposals, um, which all uh, aim to uh, bring the EU policy framework in line with the new um, climate objectives of reducing um, emissions by 55% at least uh, by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. And so this uh, is a, a network of proposals with many interlinkages. Um, and one of them, of course, uh, is refuel EU aviation, um, because among other proposals, there was a need to strengthen um, the uh, policy uh, requirements um, to bring aviation in line with the climate goals of the EU. Um, so the legislative procedure um, with the EU member states and the parliament um, has just started following the adoption by the commission. And um, we can expect if everything goes well, uh, that in the course of 2022 sometime, um, the um, a final text could be adopted. So on the next slide, I will dive uh, a bit more into the, the, the substance um, for today's discussion on aviation and SAF. Um, so as I said, strong need uh, at EU, um, a European level, I would say, to accelerate decarbonization of aviation. Um, and as other speakers have said today already, there are several options to do this. Um, I would say quite limited options, but th there are some, and one that has high potential uh, is of course sustainable aviation fuels because today aviation is still reliant on fossil energy for uh, probably around 99% uh, or more uh, of its uh, fuel mix. Um, so unfortunately this potential is completely untapped uh, at this stage and there's um, very little um, SAF that is used. Uh, so the objective of this initiative is really to uh, scale up SAF production and scale up uh, the uptake uh, of, of SAF in European aviation. So really acting on both sides of the market to break this chicken and egg cycle uh, in which the SAF market has uh, found itself now for many years. So let's move to the next slide. So that's, that's what I was saying here. Um, really something that's important is to make sure, and this has been echoed also by uh, other speakers, um, that we introduce a blending mandate, but that we do so and also being mindful of um, uh, the aviation sector uh, that is uh, very cross-border, that is international um, and highly subject to um, uh, competitive pressure. Um, so it's, it's a bit different uh, setting a blending mandate in aviation uh, compared to other um, transport sectors, for example, the road sector. Uh, and that's why we've had to come up with a, a standalone uh, regulation um, that contains many provisions that are carefully crafted for the complexities of uh, the aviation sector. The need to preserve the level playing field in aviation has also been highlighted before, and this is very important. Um, we certainly want to decrease um, emissions in the sector, but we need to also be mindful of uh, competition uh, and make sure that the market remains well functioning. 
Um, and of course, the objective uh, foremost uh, is to uh, ramp up uh, aviation fuel, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, and make sure that uh, there's a, a robust and reliable policy framework for investments to flow in production capacity expansion. Um, and, that's, and that this can be done uh, at competitive prices, uh, meaning that uh, the increase of the jet fuel cost for airlines will also be um, uh, reasonable uh, and that we don't see any distortions uh, in, in the market. All right, let's move to the next uh, slide, please. So here we talk a little bit about the design of the, the proposed regulation. Um, and um, the first thing is that when you design uh, the blending mandate, of course, um, uh, you need to think about the targets. How do you set the targets? Um, and here it, it's clear that we need it to be at the same time ambitious, uh, ambitious because uh, we have um, uh, quite uh, important climate targets in front of us. Uh, we also need to be realistic um, because, of course, this is also an important industrial endeavor. And we need to be mindful of the fact that today the soft market is really uh, in infancy. Um, so to determine the targets, we've conducted a cross uh, e economic uh, analysis that looks at um, uh, in the EU and all sectors of the economy and how these need to uh, decrease their emissions by 2050, uh, 2030 and 2050 uh, to be in line with uh, climate targets. Uh, and we've also looked more specifically at how transport needs to do, it, to do this and also how aviation needs to do this. Uh, and with an aviation, of course, um, uh, the role of SAF. And that's how we've um, determined um, the profile of the targets, also taking into account, of course, uh, the stages of development of the different SAF technologies uh, that we support. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not quite finished with the the previous slide. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we've um, selected a number of SAF technologies um, uh, that uh, we want to bring forward in this uh, mandate, very similar to what um, Norwegian colleagues have just uh, presented before. Uh, so focusing on advanced biofuels and power to liquid fuels, uh, simply because this uh, category of fuels, first of all, well, uh, are renewable. Uh, and also have the highest potential in terms of uh, decarbonization of the sector, but also uh, in terms of scalability and innovation. So these criteria were very uh, uh, important in, uh, in crafting the eligibility of the fuels. Uh, for this purpose, and also because we know that synthetic fuels, uh, also known as power to liquid fuels um, or electrofuels, um, are uh, still very costly to produce um, and, and, and the business case also needs to be supported uh, with, uh, again, this certainty uh, policy uh, signal uh, that's reliable over time. That's why we uh, also propose to introduce a sub-mandate specifically on synthetic fuels. All right, then uh, the second part, of course, is, as we said, uh, the, the, the level playing field. Um, and uh, there again, it's extremely important to make sure that uh, the transition to SAF is embraced by all airlines, uh, meaning that um, uh, there, 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 there is a common movement uh, and, uh, towards SAF um, and that the, the, the SAF premium, let's say, is spread over the aviation industry um, as broadly as possible uh, so that we limit uh, the, the distortions or the um, the, the, um, the, the premium price premium that has to be paid by individual airlines. So looking at the scope here, um, uh, the regulation applies to all air operators uh, flying from EU airports, um, with some exemptions, of course, for very uh, low traffic airlines, um, also applies to all EU airports, uh, also with some exemptions, not to overburden the very small airports and applies to all aviation fuel suppliers that distribute fuel at EU airports. Um, so the proposed uh, measures include two um, uh, main obligations, let's say. The first one is on the fuel suppliers to distribute SAF in increasing amounts over time. And the second one um, is uh, on the other side of the market, on the airlines to uplift uh, aviation fuel that a priori will be SAF blended aviation fuel. Uh, prior to flights. Uh, and this second measure is also referred to as an anti-tankering measure. Um, and here we, uh, in fact, try to uh, uh, kill two birds with one stone. Um, notably, we also stimulate the, the demand side of the market, but we also 
um, address uh, the practice of tankering, um, which is one uh, by which airlines uh, carry excess fuel uh, on board. And, um, um, for most uh, of the, the cases for economic reasons, but it can also be for operational reasons and naturally for uh, safety reasons, but that's a different story. Um, and that also creates some uh, distortions in the market where it happens, but more importantly, it also um, uh, leads to additional excessive uh, unnecessary emissions in the aviation sector. So it would be a bit um, uh, counterproductive to um, uh, allow this practice to, to go on if it can be avoided, of course. Of course, last point is the uh, enforcement. And here we, uh, like any good regulation, needs also good uh, enforcement system. Uh, and here we have um, provided uh, a regime of penalties to make sure that um, uh, fuel suppliers um, when, and airlines were not compliant with their obligations um, have a dissuasive system that's in place um, uh, to make sure that um, the, the obligations are, are well respected. Next slide, please. Um, so very quick word on this on this slide. Uh, as I said, very important to have harmonized uh, rules across the EU. Um, as we said, um, things are, are easier. Um, the policy signal is clear um, when um, we come with uh, one target, uh, one set of sustainability requirement, and that this applies to the uh, fuel industry across the board um, in the EU. Um, so uh, this also has a, a very a strong uh, benefits uh, for, for airlines because it means that uh, there will be the same requirements all over the territory and airlines will not be subject to different uh, levels of uh, SAF um, depending on whether their home base is in one state or the other. Um, and that will also uh, reduce the potential for market distortions um, and unfair uh, um, systems where some airlines would uh, probably have higher uh, jet fuel costs depending on where uh, they fly to. Um, and then just a point on the fact that um, for a long time aviation was uh, included in um, let's say overarching targets under the renewable energy directive and this proved to um, not deliver a lot of sustainable aviation fuels um, so there was really uh, the, the feeling that there's a, a strong need, and we also understood this from the industry, um, to have aviation dedicated targets, uh, aviation dedicated uh, policy framework that really uh, puts a, a strong emphasis on sustainable aviation fuel. And finally, timing is important. Um, if we want to uh, reach our 2030 climate targets, um, the ramp up of SAF needs to take place um, already uh, already now um, and as soon as we have uh, this uh, legal certainty this policy push this is really when uh, we believe investors will uh, start uh, um, uh, putting money in production capacity um, so to cut a long uh, story short um, the sooner the better uh, all right let's go to the next slide and i'm almost over and um, this one is a good one because it's about the expected benefits um, so an aviation sector that's fit for the future, and uh, very important. Uh, we all want um, um, citizens to be able to fly more responsibly, um, fly in a greener way, um, but also we want aviation sector to be uh, fit for the future, meaning that the, the market, the aviation market uh, remains well functioning. Um, and that will be for the benefits of regions, uh, businesses and the citizens climate benefits, we've talked about this 5% emission reduction by 2030. This would be uh, the, the expected benefits of, of the SAF mandate that we propose. Um, and in the longer term, of course, much greater uh, climate benefits with around 60% reductions uh, in sector. Um, this SAF mandate is also an opportunity for the EU to become an industrial uh, leader uh, in this technology, uh, especially as we focus on uh, technologies that are quite cutting edge uh, innovative and so this is also uh, a strong um, a key objective. Employment benefits uh, are also obvious if we uh, expand uh, the renewable energy uh, industry um, uh, additional jobs will be created and also uh, benefits in terms of public health um, with um, you know uh, re reduction of uh, air pollutants and uh, other co-benefits triggered by the increased use of SAF. 
last slide, and this one will be about uh, a set of flanking measures. Um, flanking measures are, are, are measures that are not uh, included um, in our legislative proposal, but that will accompany and, let's say, support uh, the, the policy framework we propose. And first and foremost, uh, efforts at a global level. This is very important because the, the, the EU vision is not to take action only uh, at EU level, but also to um, uh, steer uh, a movement um, and uh, have some improvements on, on SAF policies also at global level. This will allow to uh, reduce emissions in the sector at uh, international level, but also to cater for this level playing field that's very important. Um, the second one is uh, the possible creation of in, an industrial alliance at European level um, uh, for the production of sustainable aviation fuels, but also uh, potentially to facilitate the certification of new SAF technologies. And the third point uh, is also about the mutual reinforcement uh, of the other uh, Fit for 55 package initiatives. Um, so we had other measures on uh, the uh, energy taxation directive uh, that can also support the uh, reducing the price gap uh, between fossil fuel and sustainable aviation fuels, but also in a revision of the um, EU uh, emissions trading system. Uh, and of course, in the renewable energy directive that has also been um, uh, revised, at least a proposal was made to revise it. So that's that's it for my slides. Um, I hope it was useful and um, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Gregoire. Uh, this was a really interesting presentation and, uh, and a good introduction to your proposal. Now we will hear from the European Parliament uh, and we are very happy that Mrs. Elsie Katainen member of Renew in the European Parliament will give us her reflections on biofuels in aviation. Please, Mrs. Elsie Katainen, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for the organizers for inv inviting me to this event, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it has been very interesting to hear about the Norwegian approach on biofuels and the mandatory sustainable alternative fuels blending mandate. Along with Norway, my home country, Finland, is a pioneer in terms of the national blending application. We have set a, a 30 target by 2030. This is one of the most ambitious targets in the EU and in the line with Finland's target of climate neutrality by 2035. There are also similar plans in Sweden, Netherlands, France and Spain, for example. Finland is now considering practical solutions to achieve this goal without weakening the international airlines competitive position as our Helsinki Vanta airport is an important hub, especially for the routes from Europe to Asia. <clears throat> to reach the ambitious goals of the European Green Deal, a broad approach is needed, looking at every transport mode, including aviation, which has been, uh, despite the technological progress, one of uh, the fast, faster growing sources of greenhouse gas emission before the pandemic. Um, thank you for Mr. Lecomte for introduction, the refuel EU aviation proposal, which I see is a histori historical initiative. In general, I find that the proposal offers a good framework to ensure a greener and more sustainable aviation sector in the future. Decarbonizing aviation is an important but also challenging part of the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package. Uh, an EU-level blending mandate is an effective tool to reach this goal, since it creates a common EU-wide approach and harmonized uh, rules to address the issue. As a member of the EP Strand Committee, I'm looking forward to be working closely to this file. 
um, this autumn and would like to share with you some first reflections. It is important that the proposal ensures a level playing field and stable policy framework that encourages companies to invest in, in this sector. It is also important to ensure that the producers of the sustainable alternative fuels are given the necessary technical and financial support uh, to increase innovation in the field and make the uh, process of getting new biofuels approved easier and more effective. When it comes to the percentage of the blending application, in my opinion, the volume percentage to blend a minimum of 2% of uh, sustainable aviation fuel from 2025, um, rising to uh, 5% in 2030 and 63% in 2026, the 20 50 could possibly be more ambitious already from the start and the path to 2030 and 50 can be more balanced uh, as we anyway see huge rise by the 2050 and as we have the necessary raw materials uh, biofuels and innovations ready to use already uh, there are also issues in the staff proposal where the need for flexibility needs to be addressed. Uh, the proposal would seem to be based on the requirement to refuel at every airport, although this may, may not be necessary for all airlines. So I'm sure that the goal legislators will take a look here if the legislation is flexible enough in this respect. However, in order to make a full use of uh, materials available for biofuels, especially uh, from waste and residues, the proposal should keep a broad criteria on which materials are allowed as biofuel. Um, this is key to secure the supply of SAP. All fuels included in the current RED2 should be covered in refuel EU aviation proposal. Um, the raw materials of, for biofuels are relatively scarce and to ensure that they are efficiently used and that, uh, that the production doesn't shift away from the EU to other countries in the forefront of this, uh, just as the USA, we need to ensure that wide range of sustainable raw materials. To secure both the demand and supply of the sustainable aviation fuels, we need to also invest in innovations and build a regulatory framework, which leaves the door open for new innovations and also raw materials. We need more funding on research and innovation in the field. The EU budget for innovation and research is not as ambitious as we would have hoped for the European Parliament. <clears throat> but in the end, we will have a strong budget for the next seven years to cover also many important research challenges related to aviation. The EU global pioneer in sustainable aviation fuels and I believe that this legislation will permanently change the global aviation environment. It is therefore important in all activities of the union to aim for other continents to introduce um, an ambitious blending application as well. In this way, we will also achieve the best result in the fight against climate change. We need to create a model that creates a vibrant and strong uh, global market for biofuels, which secures also vital and strong single market. Uh, yes, these are the topics from my side. Thank you all for this opportunity and good day to you all. Unfortunately, I can't take part of the 
Q&A session. But thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Mrs. Elsie Katain, for your words and for your reflections and thoughts about uh, the new proposal from the Commission. Then we move on to the, to the, the last speaker, uh, Mrs. Maya Strnat Mesko. Uh, she's councillor for transport at the Slovenian Permanent Representation. And she will tell us about the way forward uh, with this proposal during the Slovenian presidency. Please, Mrs. Maya Mesko, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Kaya, for a nice introduction. Uh, at the beginning, I would uh, like to thank uh, the Mission of Norway to the EU for organizing this uh, important event and also for inviting me to take a part uh, on it. I can uh, present a state of play of discussion in the Council of the European Union. Uh, but uh, firstly, let me um, say that uh, one of the main priorities of Slovenian presidency in the field of transport is uh, and are also the alternative, alternative fuels. The new smart and sustainable mobility strategy sets a target of a 90% reduction in transport emission by 2050. And the first technological step on this path is the development and widespread use of alternative fuels. Uh, with that regard, uh, Slovenian presidency welcomed the proposal for a regulation by the Commission on ensuring a level playing field for sustainable air transport. Uh, Slovenian presidency already started with the presentation and first uh, discussion on uh, refuel aviation file already on, in July. The discussion resumed in autumn already uh, after the summer break. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would say that uh, the proposal received quite a positive welcome uh, from the member states. Now it's, um, uh, it, it will be our uh, job to find an agreement uh, between the member states. Uh, and uh, we, we are looking forward to work uh, with all the member states at this stage. And uh, hopefully uh, we are, and that having in mind that Slovenian presidency is ambitious in, in uh, alternative fuels, uh, we will uh, do, our best to reach an agreement uh, in uh, under our presidency uh, with the general approach. Let's hope and finger cross that uh, we will be successful on that. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, from this. Uh, for giving us uh, your, your your the presentation from the Slovenian presidency. Uh, and we wish you real success in your work ahead. Then uh, it's time to move on to the Q&A session. And we have received some questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, uh, it's the first question here, it goes to the Norwegian Ministry for Climate and Environment. Um, uh, will the evaluation on the SAF national quota to be carried out in the autumn revise SAF costs projections, projections and availabil availability in light of EU revised red and refuel EU proposals? Uh, Please, Martin, may you answer to that question? Yes, thank you, Kayan. Thank you very much for the question. I think the, the evaluation now uh, will evaluate the experiences of the existing mandate, but uh, price and availability, uh, also in light of the new plans in EU, will be 
part of the needed assessments before further increases in the, the mandate. So yeah, the short answer is uh, no, but yes, yeah, we will uh, assess uh, price and availability before further increases. Yes, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, then uh, the next question comes from Sven Seyland. Uh, and it goes uh, either to Avinur or to the Ministry for Climate and Environment. Um, perhaps uh, first uh, Olav in Avinur can, can, uh, can answer this. The Nordic Council recommends a harmonized Nordic blend in mandate for sustainable aviation fuels. Is it achievable? If so, how? Perhaps if Avinur goes first? Yeah, I can, I can give it a try, although I think it's maybe more appropriate that the Ministry answer this question. Uh, we are obviously aware of this proposal, uh, and I don't know, for, for practical reasons, I assume it's, it would be possible to fulfill, but what should also be aware then that we have already two sort of different models uh, in place. Uh, in, in Norway, we have chosen a volume-based uh, approach. Uh, whereas in uh, the Swedish mandate is based on, on, on carbon reduction, so slightly different uh, approaches that will have to be um, aligned, I guess, somehow, if, if uh, this will be implemented. But I think I'll have to kick the ball over to Martin again, because uh, uh, I don't think it's appropriate that we as an airport operator um, sort of elaborate too much on what is doable and not doable on, on this level. Thank you. Thank you, Olav. Then, Martin, would you like to come in? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I think the, the the model can start to say that it, it sounds uh, interesting, but but it has not been. Uh, I I can't say now if it's achievable or or not uh, yet. So we have not uh, considered it now. We have introduced this blending mandate now, and and what we and it's to be evaluated and then with further increase or adjustments will be be considered yeah thank you so much then there's a quite a specific question for, to mr lecomte uh, small airports will be exempted can you define small Yes, thank you for this question. Um, so uh, as we explained previously, um, it's important to uh, provide also some flexibility in this in this proposal and small airports would be exempted um, if they are below certain thresholds in terms of uh, passenger traffic and in terms of uh, cargo carried um, over the course of a year. Um, the thresholds we've set are of um, 1 million passenger uh, of traffic uh, per year and 100,000 um, uh, tons of uh, cargo per year. So these are the two thresholds uh, below which uh, airports would be uh, exempted. We also exempt airports that are located in the outermost regions. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much. I think that was a very precise answer. Then it, there's one more question for uh, you, Gregor. Uh, will the SAF mandate in EU refuel all, allow also recycled carbon fuels, for example, the non-biological fraction of MSW, as done by Velocis, or will the renewable fuels of non-biological origin be limited to e-fuels in this initiative? Thank you for this question. Um, uh, as I explained before, we really focus on fuels that are, that are um, 100% re renewable, um, and um, we do, of course, have this sum on it on renewable fuels on non-biological origin. And there we focus really on the e-fuels um, that are produced from 100% renewable electricity. Uh, so, for example, renewable carbon fuels that are produced from uh, waste plastic and have this fossil origin um, that we, um, we don't count as eligible in, in, uh, in our proposal. Um, so that's, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I hope to. Uh, we go ahead. Will EU refuel aviation allow for higher ambition level to, to gather for national initiatives already in place? Uh, 
this must go to you as well, Grégoire? Yes. Um, so the answer to that question is that we really take um, an industry uh, approach. So we set, we set regulation and, and requirements directly on the industry at EU level. Uh, so it's different from uh, the approach taken in the Renewable Energy Directive, where um, the directive sets obligations on member states to set out obligations on the fuel suppliers. Here in Refuel, we set directly the obligations on the industry. So um, there, there's not this possibility for member states to have uh, different uh, levels of requirements on their national uh, fuel suppliers. And uh, the, 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 the reason for this is very simple, is like we explained before, this need for a level playing field across the industry uh, and to make sure that we also uh, share as much as possible the um, uh, production capacity of SAF since at the moment it's very uh, limited and that we can have uh, still ambitious targets across the EU. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much again. Then there's a question from Lauris Kanderis. What are Norwegian experiences with airlines in fueling up the SAF blends in Norwegian airports for international, especially short haul flights? Uh, perhaps this goes to Avinur? Yes, I can try to answer that. I don't know if I really understand the question, but how this works is that um, uh, you can't really choose whether you will have uh, a, a portion of, uh, of SAF in the fuel you uplift at the airports in Norway or not. Uh, so, um, as, well, you can't choose as an airline. So, uh, whether it's international flights or domestic flights, uh, over the year, half a percent of uh, advanced biofuels must be dropped into the Norwegian fuel system. Uh, as I mentioned in my in my little presentation last year, it was dropped in in, in Oslo and 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 Olesen, uh, but the total amount it was dropped in was half a percent of the total amount of fuel sold. So um, uh, we don't really have any sort of experiences of of international flights, short haul flights, because uh, as an airline, you sort of get what you get uh, somehow at, 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 at the airports. So there's no, no discrimination between the airlines or between flights. I don't know if that was, you, uh, you, you, you could perhaps um, uh, specify the question again in the, in, the, in the box there and I'll try to, try to answer again if, if I was unclear. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. And, and we hope Lauris Kanderis will do so if, if he, he wasn't, uh, happy with it, with the answer. Then there's one more question from Christian Ernhede. I hope I pronounced this quite well. And it goes to Martin Smetsru Christensen. Do you see a particular opportunity for Norway to supply biofuels to the EU with the coming SAF mandate? Yes, thanks for the uh, question. Um, we do not, firstly, we do not uh, have any production of SAF in, in Norway today, uh, but uh, it's several companies working with production of advanced biofuels, both for road transport and, and different uh, transport modes. So maybe, but uh, I can't uh, talk for the, the single companies here. So but we, we may, be, may have some production in the, the years to come and it may be sold to the EU market. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Then there's a question from Anders Fagernes uh, and it goes to the European Commission. When do you expect the union database to become active and how do you plan for the accounting to be organized? Yes, thank you for this question. Um, so the union database is set out under the, the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, so it's, it's not something that I personally deal with, but it's more my, my colleagues in the energy um, department. Um, nevertheless, as far as I'm aware, um, the this union database is under preparation. Um, there are still a number of, of things to, to, to be prepared for, for it to be operationalized, but I understood that it's a question of months uh, to do some final testing um, and um, 
I don't want to say anything uh, wrong or prejudging their work, but I understood it would be um, in the early phases of next year, but uh, with a caveat that uh, maybe this needs to be checked, but it's a question of months. Thank you so much uh, again. Uh, then there's a question from Einar Gotos. Uh, do the Norwegian mandate have to be adjusted to the EU target or will it be possible to have a higher mandate in Norway? I'm not sure who is, if it goes to the European Commission or to the, to the ministry, perhaps both want to elaborate a bit on that. Maybe I can I can give it a, a first try. Um, so, would the Norwegian mandate have to be adjusted to EU targets? Um, I don't think there's a specific uh, any kind of specific requirement for this to to take place. Um, I understand that uh, um, as our our proposal has an EEA relevance as well, um, meaning a relevance to the uh, European Economic Area, uh, and there are joint committees to. Um, look at um, this kind of decision whether to align uh, some um, uh, such uh, legal provisions, um, but I don't think there's any automaticity uh, or any systematic um, um, alignment. Um, so, but again, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, maybe best to ask uh, ask somebody who has more legal experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if if Martin would like to to add something or. Uh, I don't really think I have so much to add to that answer. So it, it's now on the proposal stadium, and then we have to 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 take a deeper look at it. And yeah, it's now in the the Ministry of of Transport as well in in Norway. So it's yeah, we are different ministries, and yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it's in process. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. Uh, then uh, we have a question from Harry Havisto. Could you elaborate a bit why in refuel EU proposal suitable feedstocks are limited to red to annex, uh, annex nine, part A and B, comparing to road transport where all sustainable feedstocks are okay with certain share limitations? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for the question. So this is uh, the result of uh, various considerations. The, the first one um, is that, as I explained before, we wanted to focus on um, biofuels uh, and, and feedstocks that are uh, entirely renewable and that do not compete with uh, the food and feed uh, markets. Um, so um, this is why we chose to focus on, on Annex 9 of the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, we also wanted to make sure um, that we don't uh, select um, types of uh, feedstock or types of biofuels that are capped under the Renewable Energy Directive to uh, an extent that also, by the way, some of them would be uh, phased out according to EU rules by 2030. Um, and so uh, focus more on, uh, on, on, on feedstock that have... Uh, uh, more uh, potential for scalability also from a legislative uh, regulatory point of view. Uh, but something uh, else that we had in mind, of course, was the necessity to avoid um, uh, any uh, uh, excessive shifts of biofuel volumes from the road sector, for example, to the aviation sector. Uh, and we know that right now in uh, the, the, the road sector, at least in the EU, uh, the, the majority of biofuels are produced from uh, vegetable oils. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, crop-based um, uh, crop feedstock. Um, so we want to uh, make sure there's no um, uh, displacement or at least limit this. And that's why we focus on this more um, um, uh, innovative set of, uh, of uh, feedstock. But also, the last thing uh, is that we uh, understood from the consultation with the uh, industry, um, uh, but also from uh, consultations with NGOs um, and with airlines, uh, that there was not a, a big appetite um, to expand the scope of eligible feedstock to crop-based uh, biofuels uh, to uh, avoid um, 
uh, to avoid entering into uh, some specific uh, debates on the sustainability of those feedstocks. So that's why we really focused on power to liquids and um, uh, Annex 9 Part A and B. Um, so I hope that answers your uh, question. Yeah, I think so. I think you gave a really good answer there. <laughs> then uh, a lot of questions to the Commission here. Uh, one more. Uh, if the EU member states cannot alter the refuel EU targets, is there anything they can do if they want higher SAF volumes? Um, yeah, the, the short answer is is yes, I would say, but most importantly, I think um, the requirement that we set on the industry is only a, a minimum requirement. Um, so uh, in that sense, the, the, the targets don't have to be taken uh, so strictly. Uh, the industry can supply more than what is um, uh, than what is set in the target um, if, if there is capacity to do so and if, if there's um, also an appetite on the other side of the market. So that's not a problem at all. Uh, and member states can also take um, a national uh, dispositions um, uh, to, I don't know, with investments at national level, at local level to uh, stimulate the production of, of SAF and ensure that uh, the amount of SAF that is um, uh, supplied, um, uh, I mean, also to stimulate the, the industry. Um, uh, so that's that's my answer to uh, to this question. All right. Thank you again. And here there's one more for you, uh, Grégoire. Can any EU country set other rules than decided by EU? For example, define other limits for small airports? So, the, the, the short answer to this question would be, from a legal perspective, I believe, no, because we set a regulation. So uh, proposing a regulation means it applies across the EU. Uh, and there's um, so it's it's rules, like, once again, that apply directly to, to the industry. Um, so there's a limited, uh, 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 there's limited um, margin of maneuver. Uh, on the contrary, for example, to a directive where there, there's transposition uh, at national level that allows uh, for um, different kinds of implementation. So it's a, it's a different system. Thanks. Thanks again. Uh, and here's a, a, a question from Mikael Fiedler Panayotto Paulos. Uh, and it goes to uh, Mr. Chris Christensen uh, and Mr. Lecomte. Uh, we first start to Ms. Mr. Christensen, I think. The 2020 staff mandate in Norway was fulfilled solely from Part B feedstocks. Uh, of Annex 9. These waste lipids were diverted from road transport to be converted into fuel for aviation and had led to 2,500 tons of additional CO2 emissions. Using waste lipids for biodiesel leads to higher greenhouse gas emission savings of 90% compared with HIFA. That leads to around 76% of greenhouse gas savings. Are EU and national policymakers aware that focusing in one technology, HIFA SAF, hinders the development of novel and more scalable technologies for aviation and clearly leads to a worse climate mitigation effect? Uh, that, that was a really long question. And I, I, Martin, would you go first? Yeah, thanks. I, yeah, it's uh, long and uh, complicated, and I think that's part of the answer as well, that biofuels policy are really complicated. So uh, I think, yeah, I, I've heard this question before, and it's complicated, but we had to start somewhere with the uh, mandate in, in Norway uh, with the 0.5% advanced biofuels, both A and, and both B and both A and B. And uh, yeah, we are we uh, we are uh, yeah, looking on how to do it further, but I have no more answer than that. I, I think it's complicated. Yeah, as we all know, biofuels uh, mm. are very complicated and there are a lot of debates on the effects and implications of biofuels. Uh, so I think we just go on further to the, to the next question. Then it comes from Anne Marit Hayos. 
in the proposal of the refuel EU Aviation Directive Article 11 suggests that member states shall transfer the amount collected through those administrative fines as contributions to the Invest EU Green Transition Investment Facility. Um, though, how and how does uh, how this, will this work in practice? Uh, thank you. I appreciate this question. It's it's getting very uh, very technical and very precise. Um, <laughs> I don't have, I'm not going to give you a long explanation. Um, there are various um, uh, EU, EU policies that also contain this kind of uh, uh, channeling funds towards uh, channeling revenues to specific uh, funds. Uh, there, there, there are systems to, to do this. I, I, I don't have, um, I don't master all the, all, the, all the details of how this functions in practice, but um, probably if this person's really interested, I, I could direct them to somebody who would uh, advise them with more detail. Thank you so much. I think you have really answered a lot of details so far, so very understandable. Uh, yeah, then there's a, a last question here, and it goes also for the Commission. Is it correct to understand that one of the tanti tankering provisions in the pro proposal is that all commercial aircraft would need to refuel every time before they take off from a Union airport? Um. Yes, I can take this question. So, um, so yes, this 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 question refers to the obligation to uplift jet fuel prior to departure um, from EU airports. Um, so, uh, as you can see, if you look at the the proposal, so this is the anti tankering uh, measure. Um, it, it's not per se before each uh, departure, although this obligation will require air, um, airlines um, for for all of their flights departing from a specific EU airport to make sure that on aggregate um, uh, they, they uplift at least 90% of the jet fuel that's required to operate the flights from this airport. Uh, and that is to, uh, to ensure that they don't arrive at EU airports um, with um, a tank that is twice as full as it should be to perform the flight, uh, because as we explained before, this um, triggers an excess of unnecessary uh, fuel burn and uh, emissions. So it's trying to address this problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, then I uh, don't see any more questions from, from the audience. Yes. Uh, Yeah, uh, one more question from Anish Fagenas to the European Commission. What level will you set the penalty level at and how do you consider the risk of establishing a price floor for SAF? Yes, thank you for the question. So uh, on the penalties, uh, maybe just a quick word on penalties. It's a little bit tricky and uh, probably our uh, Norwegian colleagues have also um, uh, found this a little bit difficult at the beginning of, of their own uh, mandate to uh, design a penalty regime um, for a market that is uh, basically in infancy or, or a very early stages. Um, so we've we've decided on the methodology to, um, to 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 calculate the penalties that should be uh, should be applied in case of non non compliance uh, of the fuel supply, um, but we will very much uh, uh, monitor um, the relevance of this me methodology um, as as time goes uh, because we know that um, it might become more more or less uh, relevant as the market establishes itself. Um, so what we have uh, proposed to set up at the moment uh, in Article 11, if you want to have a look, by the way, because um, so is to um, uh, is to is to apply a, a double the, the double the so multiply the price of, of the um, difference uh, difference in price between um, the, the the SAF and the conventional jet fuel, um, and apply this price difference to double uh, the amount uh, of fuel that was not supplied. So it's a little bit tricky, um, but uh, we 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 um, uh, we refer to member states to decide uh, on uh, the exact amount of the penalty that should be applied uh, to the uh, market operator, um, uh, knowing that we also um, 
require uh, our safety agency, uh, aviation uh, safety agency to um, uh, report to the commission every year on the state of the market, including with price information. So the member states uh, can refer to um, fuel prices in, in that report. And that's a good way to, uh, to calibrate uh, the amount of the penalties. Thank you so much again. Uh, then I just have, have I missed some questions? I don't see any more questions from the audience uh, now. So that means that everybody has received an answer to their question. Uh, or if you don't, please uh, tell us in the Q&A window as fast as possible, because we are also soon running out of time, but we have time for some, perhaps one more or two more questions, if there are any more again. If not, um, I think, okay, there's one more. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, one more from Christian and Hede. Uh, for uh, Arne Jungmann, that's nice. Uh, a question also for, for, for BP. Where do you currently source your biofuels? Please, Arne. Yeah, um, sorry if I should uh, go into details there, but, um, but uh, we do have, I think it's uh, public knowledge that we do have an agreement with Nestle in Finland. Uh, we also have other sources. So uh, and the important thing is that it's, um, it's a sustainable feedstock based on sustainable feedstock, and uh, so we mostly used uh, used cooking oil for this feedstock. But uh, it yeah, could be many different uh, sourcing uh, going forward. But the uh, but main thing is that it's based on sustainable feedstock. Thank you. Uh, then I think it's time to to wrap up. Um, and I will thank all of you for attending this webinar today and for taking part in, in the discussion as well. Uh, we see that there is a lot of discussion going on uh, regarding biofuels in these days. A lot of stakeholders arrange webinars and debates. Uh, and then it remains for me to say, keep the good discussion going because biofuels is complicated as some of the speakers already have, have said. Uh, and uh, the, my last word it will then be, have a really nice uh, afternoon uh, to all of you from all of us here at the Mission of Norway to the EU.